Where's all the money gone? The drain pipe of destiny, the least friendly snowman, and the highest ratio of bureaucratic bodies per square kilometer on Earth. We're going to Brussels, baby! And we're talking corruption. Let's do this! Welcome to Season 2 of the Standard Time Talk Show. This year we'll tour Warsaw and Brussels, as well as our beloved Vienna and Budapest, to meet people from all over Europe and talk about trash, tourism, forest fires, and so much more. I'm your host, Reka Kinga Pop, and in each episode I'll be joined by guests from all over the continent. We release new episodes every second Thursday, so go hit the subscribe button now the little bell notification right after, and then set 5 to 17 additional alarms to make sure you never miss an episode. Tell your mom, tell your son, share the show with all your friends and foes. Also, don't forget to turn on the subtitles in one of the 15 languages we publish and comment below to tell us what your mother tongue is. For a strong start into the new season, today we talk about corruption within the EU. That's right, kids. And since I'm a Hungarian in Brussels, you better believe we have some hilarious pilgrimage sites to visit. Now, the EU might dwarf in geographical size compared to Russia or China, but economically speaking, it federates incredible power. Uh-oh, this is our alarm signaling that we are going to throw some data at you. The European Union's GDP is estimated to be 17.82 trillion euros in 2024, representing around one-sixth of the global economy. It's so much money even the Spanish Habsburgs couldn't pointlessly waste it all. I mean, look at this cutie. He's Philip III of Spain, and already his collars must have cost more than, well, more than me. But let's get back to the continental conundrum. The European Union is also a most devoted public spender. But where does all this money go, I hear you ask, in my head? We know, of course, billions are spent on roads and rails and harbors and hospitals and some little money even on this show somehow. But let's be a negative Nelly for a second, put all the positives aside and look at how much of this so, so much we actually lose. Drum roll, please. Corruption is estimated to cost the European Union between 179 billion and 990 billion euros per year, amounting to up to 6% of its total GDP. Now, there's a lot of guessing space between those numbers, but even if we take the more conservative estimate, that's enough money to go to the moon 10 times and open a schnitzel house up there. Or buy all your friends and foes the world's most expensive toy called Rabbit, which somehow looks like a very violent, intimate plaything for polygamous polyglots. Or, and I know I'm sounding crazy, but we could maybe invest all those lost billions in green energy, use it to improve public health systems, fund schools, or, I don't know, something. 70% of Europeans believe that corruption is widespread in their countries. This has worsened by two points compared to 2022. But when it comes to the union's money, we must clarify something. 80% of all EU funding, so four out of every five euros, are distributed by member states, putting them in prime position to enforce their local interests. But it also provides some of them with an opportunity to abuse such funds with fairly little oversight. Take, for instance, my beloved home country, Hungary, where Prime Minister Viktor Orbán's son-in-law miraculously became one of the country's richest businessmen in just a few short years, winning tender upon tender from public and EU funds. And the union's opportunities for oversight were limited. This is not the ice palace of your favorite cartoon snowman. This is the European Anti-Fraud Office, and they investigate the use and abuse of EU funding. Now, the trouble is, although their investigations are extremely important to understand what happens with EU money on a nation state level, they cannot enforce consequences. They only make recommendations, and the nation states decide for themselves what to do with their findings. And sometimes what they do is uh, <clears throat> left us wanting. But setting the jokes aside for just a minute, the EU has really been very slow to respond to Hungary's abuse of funding. 
After many years of investigating, reporting, and finger-wagging over corruption and the country's democratic demise, in 2023, they finally froze 10.2 billion euros in EU funds, just to show Hungary that, yes, the EU has the balls, or the ovaries, I guess, to enforce consequences, just to unfreeze them again in a few months. What's your game, European Union? Now, since the EU is a federation and not a singular state, institutions are not united, jurisdictions are limited, and most often the consequences of corruption require unified political will to enforce it. And on this note, I have a nice pilgrimage site to introduce to you. Behold the drain pipe of destiny, a tourist site that every Hungarian coming to Brussels must visit and pay their respects to. This is the drain pipe that allegedly, according to media and police reports, served as the vessel that Jozef Sayer, then member of the European Parliament of the Fidesz party, slid down butt naked wearing nothing but a rucksack, escaping an illegal sex party. Now, this may have contributed to the quick souring of Fidesz's and the European People's Party's relationship soon after, because in his person, Fidesz's most important European politician was lost. But this illegal and allegedly also drug-fueled sex party was very far from the worst thing that Jozef Sayer has ever done. He is the sole author of the Hungarian base law, which replaced the previous Hungarian constitution, paving the way for Fidesz's monolith takeover of the Hungarian political system. He even bragged about having written it merely on an iPad on a train between Strasbourg and Brussels, which is a weird brag. He probably, or is allegedly, to have played a role in the weakening of the independence of the Hungarian judiciary as well. Isn't it marvelous? If you want to pay your respects at this site, just search for The Drain Pipe or Oz Eres on Google Maps. It's marked as an official memorial site. Definitely worth a visit. But tell me, what's the illegal activity you would like to escape from butt naked and high as a kite if you were a member of parliament? Let me know in the comments. We'll dramatize the best suggestions. I'd personally be interested in disrupting the continental pickles and preserves trade, like selling apricot jams from under the counter, pushing sauerkraut to innocent children. But aside from my vinegar-filled crime ring, today we'll talk about the consequences of corruption for Hungary, how the Italian Mafia are using EU funding, and we'll also discuss the misuse of public money across all EU member states. Yes, happy Austria, I'm looking at you. And we have some newly elected MEPs to join us for this discussion, right here in the lovely basement studio of the European Parliament's Brussels building. Daniel Freund is a German politician who has been serving as a member of the European Parliament since 2019 in a group of the Greens European Free Alliance. He has been working to establish an independent ethics body to track and sanction conflicts of interests in all EU institutions. And he has some serious beef with the Hungarian government. Sabrina Pignadoli is also a member of the European Parliament since 2019, representing Italy. As a journalist, she had specialized in the affairs of the Italian Mafia, and now she's been advising on the phenomenon of mafias and other criminal associations, including foreign ones. Gwendoline Dolbos-Corfield is a French politician from the ecologist party Europe Ecologie Le Verts and a member of the European Parliament. Since 2021, Dilbos Corfield has been part of the European Parliament's delegation to the Conference on the Future of Europe. Hello and welcome, and thanks for joining me on this very hot day in this very hot basement, which is where I belong, at the basement of the European Parliament. And we're here to talk about uh, fraud, corruption, mafia, all the things we love, um, and especially the use and abuse of EU funds and what can be done about that. So let's start with you, Gwendolyn, because you have been torpedoing the upcoming EU presidency of Hungary. Not really torpedoing the presidency of Hungary, but you have been working on making sure that this, um, this round of EU presidency 
is harder or not possible to abuse? Can you tell us about this? It was very clear uh, already in 2011, 2013, and this parliament has always been at the forefront of saying, you know, what is happening in Hungary is not all right. It's not okay on fundamental rights. It's not okay on democracy, of independence of ju justice, pluralism of media, but also indeed on the abuse of EU funds and the abuse of money in general, because uh, the corruption level in Hungary is very strong. Uh, and at, on the title of that, we have have this, we have made the assessment in this parliament that uh, we consider this member state to not be completely a democracy anymore. And we voted it with a huge majority. It is now something that is even taken upon by others, the fact that we are in a quasi-autocracy in Hungary. And so the idea that uh, we doing this show in a normal way and business as usual, we have a Hungarian presidency was completely unbearable for us in parliament, but only for us. Uh, the member states, the other leaders of the member states, the people in commission and elsewhere, they didn't seem to find it bizarre. They said it was business as usual and they didn't care. So we are in this very uh, strange situation where a member state that is no more considered as a democracy, a member state that is a clear link to Putin, um, who has been abusing uh, a number of, of EU values and EU rights and has also said really bizarre things on a geopolitical point of view, saying bad things about Ukraine, saying bad things about a number of people. Uh, there are people too. <laughs> will be able to have presidency and Viktor Orban will be able to set an agenda, uh, go outside and say things. In the middle of the Trump possible election in America, he will be able to be the voice of, uh, of, uh, of uh, EU. Uh, so uh, this is a very star a bad start of this new term. My understanding of what's happening here is that the EU started out as this very loose, very patiently organized alliance of member states, or let's just say first signatories joining for certain projects. But it was always a very cautious association between parties who used to be at war with each other for a couple hundred years, right? And some are pushing for a, a more, if not centralized, St more strongly organized and controlled kind of cooperation, and some are more in favor of just economic cooperation, letting everyone do what they will type of modus operandi. Is that a, a fair reading or is there something that I'm missing because I'm lazy to read news? <laughs> no, I think there's always been the paradox that you have. It was born out of big dreams. So it was not born out of caution. It was born out of the dream of getting out of of war, being in peace, and having values. And what is written in the treaties and the text is very strong, in fact, and it has symbolized for a lot of people a project of values, a project of peace, a project of being all equal citizens, uh, benefiting from the same rights and, and no more making a difference if you are a citizen of this member state or that member state. So it does symbolize that, but it's true that in the way that it has got organized with the structures and specifically the way the leaders of the member states do it, it's, it's been this cautious approach. So we've always been in between. Um, and uh, in until all of the member states were basically applying the rules uh, not treading on each foot and uh, indeed we thought we were, we were having democracy forever, it could go fine. But the moment one of these member states starting to no more be a democracy and an autocrat starting to be leading one of this party, the, this very cautious approach meant that the other leaders just let things happen more and more and more and more to a level where today it's very difficult to to know how we'll come back to a regular system and, and to European values in, in Hungary. So the cautious approach uh, was fine with, with only nice guys around the table. They were not all very nice, but they were correct. And the day there was a bad one, he just decided, I changed the, the, the rules of the games and the others weren't, didn't dare and say anything. And he has set a precedent that could mean others will do it. And I. And I have the feeling that Georgia Meloni, but also uh, Mr. Mitsotakis, Prime Minister of Greece, is exactly applying the Orban playbook, which is, I'm not, a, I'm not playing with the rules, I'm doing whatever I want with the values, and I will have problems in the Court of Justice of Europe, I will have bad resolution coming from the Parliament, but I don't care. 
And I know that in the end, I will profit from what exactly what you said, all the economic benefits, the organization, the workers being able to travel from one place to another. I will be able to be sitting at the table and take big decisions, but I will not apply the values. I'm of the opinion that this is not the doing of one, uh, one country, one party, or let alone one man. And the, um, the second coming of the genius of the Carpathians, as we like to sometimes call him, or the self-imposed strongman of Europe is actually a facade who served as sometimes a useful idiot for uh, more conservative um, uh, agendas to push the median toward more extreme, um, more extreme sort of points of um, negotiation. And there are very, very strong uh, sort of precursors to this kind of abuse of benevolent collaborations. But the nature of the sort of benevolent collaboration shows itself also on the procedural level. I think, I mean, what is so special about what uh, Viktor Orban has done in, in Hungary is the, the enormous scale of, of corruption. That doesn't exist anywhere else on, on this scale, so centralized from the political office of, of the prime minister of a member state. It's an 18th century style sort of... Uh, well, it's a, it's a mafia state. It's, it's basically, and, and I think what you said earlier about the, the ideology of, of Orban, I think at the end of the day, the only true ideology of this man is he wants to get as much money out of the union for himself, for his family and friends as possible. <gasps> so when How you, dare you say that when, about my prime minister I never voted for? <laughs> when, when you look at, you know, he has been in office now 14 years. Hungary has received over 50 billion euros of EU funds since, in, since he became prime minister. Sounds painful to hear. And Transparency International estimates that at least 25% of that money has been stolen. Uh, by Orban and his cronies. So this is not just a few millions here and there, this is corruption on an industrial scale where at several periods they actually didn't know what to do with all this money anymore. You know, they started taking over industry after industry, financial industry, construction, they have bought the mobile phone networks, and but they couldn't in a way put all this money into Hungary, so they started buying up media in, in Slovenia, in, 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 Slovenia, Croatia, in Serbia, in, in, in other... Slovakia as well. Yeah, um, so, so it keeps exporting uh, this, this weird corrupt system it's also, also to other member that, states. that somehow the new ownership of Euronews can be tied partially to the order regime, which is also very encouraging. <laughs> no, no idea about that, but the... The problem is then that, you know, in a, in a way, the EU funded the destruction of Hungarian democracy and media freedom and uh, judicial independence and all this. You know, that was subsidized with EU funds. And for far too long, the union basically did nothing and, and looked at it uh, with amazement, but, but didn't do anything. And then, well, when the three of us came, came to the parliament in 2019, it was said, look, you can't do anything about this. Orban has a veto. Orban is member of the most powerful political party family, uh, the EPP. So forget doing anything about this. And I think... By the way, we've been trying to get EPP members to come on this discussion, but we haven't succeeded. If they are interested, please hit me up because we're very happy to talk with you. It's going to be very pleasant. And, and what we have managed here in the parliament now in this term, you know, other than qualifying Hungary as an electoral autocracy and, and reporting everything that has done is, well, that for the first time now we have the tool of freezing funds to member states when they are corrupt, when they don't have a functioning judiciary anymore. And we did that. And today, a majority of EU funds in Hungary are frozen until the necessary reforms are, are done. And the system is shaking, arguably, in, in large part due to this. I think moral outrage only goes I, I think, so far. I mean, for, for me, Poland is basically the example that has shown that this approach can work. You know, we... Yeah, but we, then you're basically advocating ex semi-externally induced regime change. No, but I... I advocate that we no longer fund the destruction of democracy in a member state with EU funds. As soon as they fulfill that criteria again, they can have the money. If in the meantime voters decide that they want a government that assures that EU funds are f f coming to the people, that 
who they're meant for, uh, you know, that's up to, to, to the voters' choice. That's exactly what Polish voters did. It wasn't the only reason, but it was one of the determining factors of why Polish, particularly Polish women, uh, voted uh, out the peace government. In Hungary so far, we haven't seen that. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the European some, election some results are, uh, are, are, there are some interesting elements in this, but we haven't seen that, you know, uh, Orban is really under pressure now with... We've Manino. seen significant change in municipal elections, which happened on the same date, which Fidesz thought was going to be beneficial for them, but turned out otherwise, which is mm. nice. They still have a, a great portion of representation in municipalities, but way smaller than they used to. So... Angus does something, but we'll see in two years by the next uh, sort of electoral round. Um, the way you explain enforcing consequences of actions makes me think about, would you talk to my preteen about her math homework, please? Because this is the same kind of fight that we have all, time, all the time, over and over again. You do something, there's a consequence. You don't do something, there's a consequence. <laughs> But you have smaller children, right? Yeah. Okay. You're very well prepared for I, uh, I, I, I can't cut their funding uh, <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> well, there's going to be pocket money that you can, and yeah. allowances that you will be able to cut later on, and especially screen times. I highly encourage that. Now, if you like what you see and we've managed to make you laugh at least once, please go to patreon.com slash Eurozine to support our work. Eurozine is the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as three euros a month or whatever you can afford, and you'll get early access to bonus materials and even get to suggest topics and questions. But now let's get back to the discussion. Sabrina, let me come to you because I sometimes feel that by this very strong focus on Hungary, um, there has been, at, at which I appreciate, both because things must change in Hungary, so the state of democracy has eroded in Hungary, but also because I for sure wouldn't have an international career without Mr. Orban, because my complaining about my country was interesting for nobody before. So that's quite nice. Um, I would love to work in my home country again, but maybe that's beyond my ambitions at this point. But I feel like this is a little bit disrespectful to say that Orban invented this, to always credit Hungary for abusing benevolent cooperation um, or abusing the rules, because it seems like we are entirely forgetting about Nicola Sarkozy and Berlusconi, of all people, who kind of pioneered this within the EU. Yes, uh, because uh, the problem of uh, Hungarian is uh, not uh, only the problem of Hungary. We have uh, a lot of problem uh, for uh, the rule of law, for example, uh, also in Italy for independence of uh, the media. Uh, the uh, Italian public uh, television is uh, completely under the uh, control of the government. And so it's not uh, exactly uh, respectful of uh, the rule of law. And uh, the, yes, the possibility to uh, do some frauds with uh, European funds is not uh, typical only with Bulgaria. I think, that, for example, I'm in uh, the... Um, um, control of budget uh, committee, and uh, we work a lot about uh, Babish, about uh, Ch Czech Republic, uh, but uh, also sometimes we find in Italy the, uh, some uh, criminal organization uh, um, or uh, some organized crime that are uh, uh, preparing uh, uh, frauds uh, with uh, European funds and uh, some uh, member of uh, the states uh, with uh, the public administration are involved. And if uh, uh, we have not a real contrast, but uh, the head of the government is involved in this kind of uh, frauds, it's very difficult for a state to fight against this kind of fraud. And I don't see that any EU member states would have a monopoly on the abuse of human rights either. So that's also quite evenly distributed between the West and the East of Europe, if you just go by these, these two measurements. But sometimes depend of uh, the government. We have, uh, for example, uh, in Italy, the situation uh, before was better. 
but now in Italy we have uh, some uh, manifestation and some public uh, events against abortion, for example. And so, uh, and uh, also the, the public television, the possibility to express uh, your opinion. There are a lot of journalists uh, that are going away from the public television. Uh, and uh, because it's impossible, they, they say uh, that uh, uh, they check also the single word in, uh, in an article, in a speech in the television. And I think it's not a freedom of, uh, of expression. Of course, you're right. I mean, if, if, if all of these member states, whatever governments they had through the years, were not uh, courageous enough to act and were not feeling able to stop Viktor Orban, it's, there's a part of this original way of doing it, which is we don't interfere in each other's things, but it's also, of course, the, the, the fear that, you know, and I'm not perfect either in my member states, so how can I judge the other one? And specifically, we know on the freezing of the funds, when they had to take the decision in this big discussion around the MFF, was a very complicated one, and some member states were really pushing for this new conditionality mechanism. We know that, for example, Italy was one of these member states that were not really willing for, for it completely because they were very afraid that they could be at the... At, uh, at one moment also targeted with this conditionality. I mean, this conditionality mechanism was not easy to put in place because a lot of member states didn't like it. And we have a number of cases where they don't want to act because they know that they are facing the same problems. But what has to be very clear is that where, where Viktor Orban pioneered even more than the others is in the systemic way of doing things. He attacked all of the things and in the scale. Uh, as it was said, it's the scale for corruption, but it's also the scale of attacking human rights. It's also the scale of attacking democracy. So we, we have a phenomenon that is, is massively bigger than elsewhere. But of course, we have failings everywhere. And I, all right, all right. Okay, I'll give, the, give him that. Sorry. No, I was just thinking, because it was what Gwendolyn said, this whole non-interference in the internal affairs of another country. You know, that's whatever Westphalian freedom uh, uh, or peace uh, 300 years ago is sort of principle of international diplomacy, right? But here, this is not interference in internal affairs. We have, in the European Union, decided we have a joint parliament together, we adopt laws together, uh, and all EU citizens are entitled to their fundamental rights and to the application of this law wherever they go in this union. It doesn't mean that, you know, I have those rights only when I'm in Germany. I have that right in every single member state, including in Hungary. But that if, if that assurance of these rights breaks down, if I can no longer, you know, uh, sue for those rights in a Hungarian court, if my EU funds are no longer protected in, in, in one or other member state, you know, this is not just the interest of one member state, this is the interest of all member states. And, and that is one of the key problems that we have and what we see now also with the presidency is sort of everyone saying, oh yeah, but that's not my problem, Hungary needs to take care of that. The European Union cannot work like that. When you have someone that abuses the system on the scale that Viktor Orban does, it's not just something that you can leave for Hungarian voters to sort out or for the internal machine in Hungary. And, and certainly the corruption you cannot just leave to Hungary because, well, Orban has transformed the system where there is no longer any controls on EU funds being abused. So that's why in that case, it then needs the entire EU to, to start looking at that problem and, and, and try to solve it and not just leave it to Hungary. I think you can leave corruption to us, we can take care of it. <laughs> In the sense, like, whatever needs doing about it. But, um, so then, when we talk about freezing funds, of course it became kind of a domestic rallying cry, and it is a rallying cry also in countries where it has been levitated, that they might, need, might be facing similar consequences. So, this, is a, this can be abused for a pol political agenda, to fuel Euroscepticism, Eurocriticism, and say, see, they're trying to intervene here. We've seen a couple of examples, for instance, uh, direct funding to uh, civil society coming from the EU, which usually the EU does not really engage directly with, 
because it's very bureaucratic. These are much bigger chunks of funding. So, you know, a barefoot NGO would have a hard time even managing these funds, yeah. let alone co-funding them. But also to municipalities, which basically is the survival method of Budapest at this point, which is being strangled and bled out mm. by the state. Is this kind of direct funding then a turn in how EU funding is organized? Do you think, do you all think that funding, uh, funding compliant projects or valuable projects directly instead of through the nation state is going to be the route for everyone? Or is this like an exceptional thing that we keep for the bad kids? So, I mean, the problem is at the moment only a very sm small share of EU funds is distributed directly by, by the Commission. There are a few programs, but the lion's share, 90% of, of the funding is basically handed to the member states and they then distribute. In some member states, federal states, they hand it down to the regions or the cities. Sometimes it's the national government distributing, depending on what funding line we look at. When we negotiated the conditionality, the parliament, me as one of the negotiators, put a lot of emphasis that the commission should make sure to reduce the collateral damage, so to speak. You know, that when funding is frozen, the, the people suffering from that should not be the ordinary citizens that actually should receive this money to whatever, renovate their schools, a hospital, to, a school, to, a to bring whatever. fast internet uh, to the countryside, whatever it is. But that this should be a sanction against the national government that is not in compliance with EU values, with rule of law and, and with anti-corruption measures. The problem is a bit, if you now reroute all the funds directly, well, first of all, it would need at about six to 8,000 uh, Hungarian speakers, experts of uh, public procurement uh, legislation in Hungary. So this is not I something that- I have a that, lot of friends. Yeah, but that you can build up overnight and then dismantle again the moment that hopefully a future Hungarian government actually complies with the, with the rules. And the other effect would then be, I mean, if the money is still all going, is there then actually any kind of punitive effect and does the behavior of, of the government then actually change or not? So in practice, it's, it's difficult. And we see that at the moment, yeah, there is some collateral damage. But I think what I would always say to, to my fellow Hungarian uh, Europeans is, look, actually the, the money being frozen doesn't change anything for you because whether the, the only person that is in a way suffering from this money not going is uh, the likes of Metzaros uh, and, and other friends and family of, of, of Viktor Orban because they would be otherwise stealing uh, those funds from you anyways. But it's true that this promise was made a lot in Hungary, I know, because when I would go to Hungary, immediately people would say, well, you're going to give us the money directly, aren't you? So there were politicians in Hungary, I think that a bit mislead, misled the people uh, because honestly, on a pragmatic point of view, it's uh, the commission has no operational way of doing it. It's not true and it's not going to happen overnight, like Daniel said, because it would mean so many people to do it. Uh, it's also true that it's, it's not a long-term wish of the member states. Member states still like to be the ones in power to distribute the money and not have direct communication between Europe and municipalities or Europe and, and, and stakeholders. That being said, I think uh, if we were creative and, and if EU doesn't turn too bad because we also are a bit afraid of, of the new powers in place. Um, but if, if we were to go on this path of trying to uh, integrate a bit more on certain point of view and also uh, improve the rule of law aspect, we could think of specific things where it would be legitimate for the Commission to, to, to fund directly. We were all very sad that uh, Erasmus and Horizon were affected because this, these are specifically programs that do foster the European values, make interconnection, make people meet. So in fact, in this case, Europe was, EU was in fact punishing itself a bit in, uh, and, and it would be two small programs that it's not complicated for the Commission to work directly with university. 
we've scored and all this. So we could start thinking of that. And there's another path that has been explored, um, pushed a lot by mayors, like the mayor of Budapest or the mayor of Warsaw when peace was still in indeed. power, which is indeed the recovery funds. These recovery funds had a number of criteria to be given. It was having green politics, uh, to, you know, it was to recover from COVID. And there was a push in this parliament and uh, through the mayors to say, you know, some of this money now for the green transition specifically needs to go directly to the municipalities because green transition is done by the cities. It's, it's, it's really the good level to do green transition. And also because we did, we, we acknowledge the fact that in Hungary and Poland, um, citizens of big cities who had chosen opponent mayors were in fact punished by their own country. And we are at a level of punishment in Budapest that is now crazy. I mean, it, it, is, it is quite amazing, in fact, that citizens of Budapest re-elect the same mayor because it's not honestly not in their interest. I mean, uh, today they're having waste problems, they're having transport problems, they're having a number of problems because all funds have been cut from the central state to Budapest. And there again, um, some of this is European money with European use, and, and we need to be much more careful on this. I, I must sort of shade or nuance this perception because on the, as, a, as a Budapest resident, uh, on the level of governance, there are waste problems, there are uh, transport problems, but on, on the level of your daily experience as a denizen in the Budapest metro area, the level and the quality and the dependability of public services is still Maintained. outstanding within Europe. And that is specifically, in my understanding, because this country and this culture is tuned to scarcity economy and making do with what we get and moving things around and finding a way and all of that. Mm. I think it's been an incredible feat, but it's also telling that the current mayor of Budapest was re-elected by a margin of 40-something votes, not 40-something percent, yeah. but 40-something thousand, 40-something votes. So it really shows that there is a, a very direct political effect in, in blackmailing, for instance, the residents of a settlement uh, by a government. And they have the means. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually quite hard to guarantee that a government does not abuse this possibility. But then, on the level of, for instance, these kinds of public services, especially trash, which is a hot question in Brussels, which is one of the dirtiest cities in Western Europe, uh, for very specific reasons, um, then the Italian mafia's involvement yes. with public services comes to mind. Well, we're in, yes, in a situation of illegality, it's easier for a mafia to enter and to do business, obviously. And uh, mafia uh, is not only in Italy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's transnational. And uh, now uh, mafia uh, uh, has understand that uh, uh, it's easier corrupt someone than uh, use violence because uh, violence is uh, so evident and uh, the police uh, uh, start to do investigation and so on, like in Duisburg in uh, Germany. But uh, if you... Um, corrupt someone. The corruption is very difficult to uh, investigate because uh, we have uh, two people that are both interested that everything uh, stay covered. And so it's very difficult in Italy, for example, our government uh, start to um, decide to put uh, corruption in the list of uh, the crimes so that it's possible to uh, use uh, Trojan on the, mo uh, on the mobile. But uh, now the new government uh, of Meloni delayed every uh, um, procedure, every um, law to uh, combat, to fight uh, corruption. Uh, corruption is uh, the easier way that uh, organized crime can enter and that mafia can enter into business. Out of uh, the Sicily, for example, out of uh, Calabria or so on, they uh, appear, they, are, uh, they look like uh, entrepreneurs. 
normal entrepreneurs and so they uh, create problem with uh, the legal economy they create probably with democracy obviously with corruption and they uh, they enter in the use of the funds because uh, we we have uh, we have a, uh, a lot of investigation about uh, for example malta or uh, uh, slovakia uh, and uh, Mafia is doing business uh, and corruption is uh, the best way to enter. And I think Slovakia is a, is a glaring example of when the Mafia starts to employ straightforwardly violent methods, it does or, or can have an immediate ripple effect, a government can fall, but systemic corruption is a much more lasting methodology, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And we have also seen, and I think this has implications also for the freezing of funds and how those have to be considered a long-term effect, because we have seen quite a number of these more authoritarian and kleptocratic uh, governments fall across Europe to some kind of a mishmash coalition that then doesn't stand its ground and then the original contender comes back with a vengeance. Display Europe is the force behind this project. It's a brand new content sharing platform that offers you articles, podcasts and videos about European culture, politics and community in 15 different languages and they don't even abuse your user data. I know, it's a shocker. Check out their latest press review. The last few elections in Europe have been extremely intense, reflecting the polarization of political discourse across the continent, says Catherine André in her press review. After failing to be appointed France's new prime minister, Jordan Bardella has become the president of the newly formed Patriots for Europe. In The Guardian, Muda argues that this new group is merely another hollow victory for the far right. Polarization is growing across Europe and the West. Nowhere is this clearer than in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, writes the Italian political scientist Natalie Tocci in The Guardian. She even wonders about democracy's chances of survival in the country. And now, back to the show. The political consensus is shifting to the right within the European Parliament as well. And that has major implications for procedures regarding the rule of law, for uh, corruption on the more economic side, which again, so much more sustainable. If you hold a gun to the head of a journalist, that's relatively easy to prove. If you just make it impossible for them to make a living, they're gonna leave by themselves, sort of voluntarily. Mm. Um, but there's a, there's a green transition that would need to happen or would have needed to happen like a decade and a half, two decades ago already and is being obstructed and delayed on so many levels. And we are in this basement and it's very hot. So we are constantly reminded of the fact that we're very late on this one. I mean, if we, if we first look at the, at the new majorities that we have now in this parliament when it comes to rule of law, I think, I mean, the majorities here in the House on, on all the Hungary resolutions on the proposal to freeze funds and so on, there have been very solid three-quarter uh, majorities and I don't think that overall picture is likely to change there is still going to be you know from the EPP over social democrats liberals greens left I, I would expect will continue to support this even if we have lost a few votes to 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 the extreme right but the dynamic that is fundamentally changing now is the progressive majority social democrats liberals greens and left we had a majority on paper in the last parliament. So when I was sitting in the negotiations, for example, saying, look, let's sue Ursula von der Leyen because she gave 10 billion uh, to Viktor Orban so that he stops blocking the Ukraine accession and the, and the financial support. I could then argue, look, I would love to have the conservatives on board that we have a broad majority in favor of the rule of law. But if you absolutely don't want, we're gonna do it with the progressive majority without you. And, and that pressure point is now lost. Mm. From now on, it's basically the EPP, it's the conservative parties that will decide, yes or no, is anything happening? And maybe on Hungary, the general line will hold what majority exactly forms. Will they continue with the Green Deal and to what extent? I mean, the extreme right has basically been running a campaign 
against everything, no Green Deal, let's scrap that. But even the Conservatives basically ran a campaign against their own Spitzenkandidat, against their own lead candidate Ursula von der Leyen, and were saying, look, we have this long list of things in the Green Deal that we want gone. The end of the internal combustion engine should be revisited. Uh, fertilizers they killed on, on agriculture in general, they don't want anything. Uh, so, and, and whether there will be majorities also to provide the necessary funding, the investment in renewable energy, in uh, European-wide electricity grids and, and so on, that, that's the question. I would hope that the argument is so strong now that even if you don't care about climate change and our responsibility to future generations or the rest of the world, that even just from a purely economic point of view, when you look at how the Americans investing, when you look at what the Chinese are investing in electric vehicles, in batteries, in solar panels, in heat pumps, in, in all the technologies that we need. If we Europeans do not massively invest, if we do not pursue the Green Deal uh, as before, what are we going to earn our money with in the future? The national level is, is exactly the level that is not interesting for, cli for fighting climate change. It's, it's, in the, it's in the duality of European big decision and big programs and big investment, investment and the actions on the ground in municipalities, in cities, in villages, that things will happen. But the national level is quite irrelevant in the, in, in the fighting for climate change. Uh, so if we have a, a weak Europe, <clears throat> we will see uh, no big improvement on, on green transition. We will still have everywhere in Europe, cities, uh, mayors, uh, but also people in rural areas trying to do things on the ground, but it won't be sufficient because they won't have this, this big format, this big infrastructure's investment on the, European, on, the, on the European level. And what is also interesting on the corruption aspect and the public procurement aspect is that, of course, Today, uh, you're right, Daniel, uh, it's not a good uh, mathematical uh, calculus to make to, to not want to invest in transition. But that being said, big fortunes today of EU are traditional big fortunes coming from fossil fuels or, or old ways of doing. Um, and they have uh, too much of an ear uh, in number of politicians on, on national level or on the European Parliament. This is also something that is a problem if we really need to work better on transparency on, on lobbying, on how public procurement are run, and on who is friend with who in this parliament also, because until uh, a number of politicians here have, are too much friend with, with fossil, f <laughs> fossil fuel people, we will, we will not see the big changes. And that's what we saw in the last month of the mandate, where suddenly we were, you know, uh, putting the brakes on a number of things because a number of politicians here, conservative politicians, were saying, my friend in, in fertilizer is not happy, my friend in automobile is not happy, my friend there, my friend there, uh, which is not good, helping. Yeah, well, we have to think about their career paths now <laughs> seriously because usually for an outgoing MEP, it used to be an option to immediately exactly. go to lobbying and now they have to wait six months until they can they become can. a professional no, no, lobbyist. No, they, they, they don't have to wait. They just, uh, it's more complicated to get an access badge to the parliament. So quite honestly, the roadblocks that, I mean, Gwen and I have fought it's so hard to get uh, a cooling off period and stuff, but what has actually been put in place, uh, very I, I, I don't think is much of an ox obstacle to any serious lobbyist. Yeah, but then then it's an inconvenience <laughs> to not have immediately exactly. an access badge. Yeah. Sabrina? I think it's important also to uh, think about the communication. I think we have a problem of communication of Green Deal. It's very difficult to communicate the importance of the uh, law here in the Parliament. And uh, also, uh, the, the storytelling is completely uh, different of the reality. For example, uh, the, the cars. Uh, in Italy, everyone uh, thinks that uh, has to change the car at uh, 2035. No, simply uh, we can't uh, produce a car with an uh, uh, engine with a... Uh, combustion. Uh, yes. And, and so it's uh, also a problem of communication. And I think that uh, European institutions should be more to uh, well communicate uh, the policy of uh, Europe. In 2032, that's quite far away. So until then, you can raise enough oxen to pull your 
all diesel cars to drive around, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's also a means of transition. I am an optimist, ultimately, in terms of this sort of economic push when you said, what are we going to be competitive in? We have a great many big white marble statues and all the tourists in the world can come here and watch them sink into the sea. Mm -hmm. So that's an option. Mm -hmm. If you want something else, maybe there's Underwater something to museums do about it. is uh, <laughs> really the future of Europe, I guess. Indeed, there's a wonderful one in Crimea with all the Lenins and Marxists that have been collected and sort of uh, endowed into the seafloor. It's kind of hard to visit right now. Yeah. I don't recommend. Thank you so much for coming. And um, Thank you. Get a great many things done in this new cycle, please. Now we want to know, what do you think about corruption in the EU? Shall the Union be authorized to control member states more closely? Or should federated members just be left to running their own businesses themselves? Share your thoughts with us in the comments below. We really want to know. If you like what you just saw, give us a like and subscribe to our channel. And also, send it to your aunt and that one weird uncle too. And consider supporting us at patreon.com slash Eurozine. This talk show is presented by Eurozine, and if you haven't heard of it, you should seriously check it out right now, because our online magazine offers a scarcity item, insight. Eurozine reviews and samples the publishing of more than a hundred partner journals across dozens of European languages and complements them with original articles so you can learn what's on Europe's greatest minds. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe Program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and the authors only, and they do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union.